Welcome back to the channel. On this video, I will answer the question I get a lot. You know, do you have a map that put all the pieces of project risk management so I could have a view and single view of all the elements from identification out to secondary, passing by the residual, mitigation, etc.? So the answer is yes, I do. Let's take a look right now. Sylvain Gauthier here, your executive producer, and today let's talk about risk management uh, in the context of a project, of course. Uh, one of the things we try to do with risk management, of course, is to provide confidence to the stakeholders that we know what's ahead of us, and we know that certain things we can't afford to have them turn into an issue, so we need to prevent this to, uh, before it comes as an issue, but also there's certain things that we know are there, and we're going to deal with them if it becomes an issue, okay? Because uh, we don't have the resource and we have certain level of tolerance for that kind of potential problem that might appear. But for that, we need to understand the full picture, okay? We need to understand what are the area we could take uh, some chance and what are the area that is a no-no, we can't go there and we're going to be talking about having no tolerance. Now, in the context of project management, for those of you that are following the PEMBOC, uh, risk management is not an easy section, okay? It's a big section, it's an important section, but it's not an easy one. And let's put it in the context that risk management is also a decision of investing. When you decide to uh, mitigate certain things or having a contingency, uh, you are making a decision of investing in case or to prevent certain things to happen. Not necessarily because things have happened. So this is a, uh, an important decision and we got to be smart in terms of where do we going to invest our resource, you know, regarding uh, working with risk. So we don't end up, you know, having too many resource committed to that. Things we don't have, people, money, all of this, it's very tight usually. So we got to be very uh, strategic in terms of where we want to focus. So for that, we have a process to go through. And based on how we going through it to the process, it helps us to make decision about where should we be focusing, where we could be accepting and say, we deal with it if there's a problem. So that's the idea of this map, is to put all the pieces together into one area. Now to help understand better uh, how the maps works, uh, we'll use the COVID-19 uh, mess that we are in, let's call it, call it this way, uh, and, and, and using the COVID-19, we could understand a lot of the decision from our government because that's what they do right now, okay? Uh, of course, we're no longer just in risk in certain cases or we're on issue, but it's still more risk coming up and this is why we're doing certain things and certain decisions are made. So we're going to use that to help put the pieces together. So I've got a map, you could see it there. So in order to help us to understand better this map, let me squeeze in the corner and get the map bigger so we could look at it and understand, you know, uh, and read it especially. So first step is to identify the risk, okay? So we're going to organize in different category. Typically, you would go with the organization structure and say, okay, uh, who's the best to look at estimation comparing from the past? So estimation will be there. Requirements will be there. You know, how confident do we know are we that the requirements we have are the right one or they might not uh, evolve. Today we're working in an environment, sometimes stakeholders, they're not sure, okay? If you're asking them about intelligence artificial or you're asking them about 5G or you're asking them about complex uh, uh, things, they might not know exactly uh, the requirements. So there's a level of uncertainty that is built in your requirements and that one, it's an area that we want to focus. Technology, of course, uh, will always be there. Market, uh, politics, resource, logistic, constraint, others, any area that you might feel could come back. Now, one good way of figuring out do we have all the category is to understand from all the stakeholders, are they in a position to identify an area that they could you ask you, you know, what about this if this happened? The idea is for you is to not be surprised uh, about a scenario or something that people would bring in that is well known and you didn't consider that. Let's say you do an event in the summer 
and it's outside. Well, for sure, a stakeholder might ask, okay, what happens okay, if, if it rains? You know, you haven't considered that. As I go, it's a good question. We're going to take a look. We're going to get back. Confidence is coming down very fast if you do that, right? So you try to go there. It doesn't mean because you identify a risk that you will deal with it, right? In certain case, you're going to have to decide, yeah, we know it's there. We'll accept it. And if it happens, it turns into an issue, we'll deal with it. That's also uh, a way that we're going to be uh, uh, putting uh, the game plan in. So once we have identified a risk, which is usually an event, if something happened, there's nothing you could do with the risk itself, okay? So for example, if I go into a presentation in a conference, I have a risk that my remote control doesn't work, okay? There's nothing I could do with the remote control that doesn't, that doesn't work. What I need to do is to understand what is the cause that would make my remote control not working and what is the effect so I could decide um, what do I do? So what could be the cause of my remote control not working? Well, it could be the battery that is dead, okay? So now what's, what is the probability of this to happen uh, uh, in terms of cause, okay? So the cause would be battery is not working, creating this event of my remote not working. Now, what's the effect of my remote not working? Well, I'm supposed to start now. Everybody's there. I might have to go quickly, you know, go downstairs, find a battery, come back, going up. We might lose 20 minutes where people are sitting there and waiting. And worse, my time is shrinking now. I get all, uh, you know, nervous and uh, the whole bit. So, so the effect, it could be like a loss of 20 minutes uh, where people have to wait. Now, what do I do? I could deal with that you know, as a separate way saying, if that happened, even though, you know, I decided that we're going to do something to prevent this, if that happened, here's what I do. I have a battery in my bag. I will just swap the battery, tick, and that's it. I just minimize the impact for, uh, for this from, you know, 20 minutes to 20 seconds. So the idea is we deal with the cause or we deal with the effect. Now, these cause are usually have a probability to happen, right? My battery not working is a probability of this to happen. Now, you know, if I've got data, um, I, I know I'll be able to have a percentage, but usually we don't need to go there, okay? We could just question ourselves and say, it's a high probability, it's a low probability, it's a medium probability, just to help us, you know, rapidly qualify the risk. So we will be looking at the cost, try to identify the probability, and we will look at the effect and try to understand the impact. So we could qualify it into what we call a matrix, risk matrix, that will put into, into axis probability versus uh, consequence. And then you could decide anything that is high probability, high consequence. Well, we need to do something about that one. Uh, and then if you have different combination, you have to decide. It helps you rapidly put all your risk and being able to qualify. Now, to do that, you will enter these risks into what we call a risk register, which is going to be the topic of another video, you know, how to build a risk register, you know, in a simple way. So you could generate what you see now on the screen, this little qualification, yellow, red, green, that's the matrix that rapidly allow you to position your risk there and make decision. Now, what kind of decision you're going to be making? Well, first one will be mitigation. You know, you want to lower the probability of these risks to happen. Okay. Mitigation will tackle that, right? We'll look and say, okay, what can I do to minimize the probability of my battery not working? Well, I'm going to test the battery before, or I'm just going to swap the battery before. So even with that, you still have a remaining probability because, you know, even tackling a certain probability with certain activity usually does not eliminate 100%. You might take it down to, uh, I don't know, high risk to a lower risk, but there's still a risk that is left. That is what is called residual risk, okay? There's still a percentage. And you'll see in the COVID example that I'll give you later on, you know, the residual is very important, okay? Uh, because we do a lot of activity to minimize the probability of contamination, but there's still a residual, okay? Now, looking at the residual, we have to take a look and say, what are the effects that we can have? 
And of course, one of the effects, let's say I go back to my battery, uh, one of the effects is uh, I can't, I'm losing time and I got people, you know, getting upset because they, it's not started and, you know, the whole schedule is screwed up. Okay, so I, I need to reduce that. Now I'm going to put together a plan B, okay? A plan that I will execute only if the issue is there. Because once we are in the effect mode, we're really in the effect, in the issue mode, okay? Except that I'm not going to try to figure out what do I do when the issue arrives. I already have a plan. If the issue is there, I'm going to go with my plan B, which is swap the battery. Okay, So that's an example of you, how you could do that. Let's say it's an event uh, that you're organizing outside in the middle of the summer. You have a chance of a rain. Uh, you can't not do anything to reduce the chance of a of raining unless you're connected to someone pretty high up. Um, but you cannot do anything to reduce the probability. So you're going to deal with the probability and the effect. Let's say it's an event outside and uh, it's a wedding and everybody's going to get wet. What can I do to reduce this effect of people getting wet? Well, I could uh, have a plan B, which is building a tent or moving the ceremony inside immediately. So I make the decision in the beginning. So contingency is putting together uh, these plan B, plan C, and, and also, if you, obviously, what you need in order of uh, um, resource for mitigating. That being said, we need to do another activity not done all the time. Not everybody's doing it. The quantification of the exposure of the risk and how much also if we decide that we're going to invest to drive the, the probability down or the effect, how much we need to invest and what is the, you know, the gain out of this. So it doesn't make sense to invest, I don't know, a $1,000 uh, on activities because we need to hire someone to do something, etc. And the exposure was $500. Okay, you would say, well, we'll deal with it if there's an issue. Okay, so the quantification is a kind of ways of figuring out how much you know you are exposed and you know if you need to protect yourself well how much it is so uh, of course we could all do that with our uh, matrix and risk register we could all do that so on the next video you'll see that that being said um, there's always going to be an impact even though we have there okay that impact could become the cause of a secondary risk that could kick in and the secondary risks sometimes are very important and more important than the primary risk. So we have to deal with that secondary risk also and then reapply the same, uh, the same thinking in terms of what do I do with the cause? You know, what, do I need an effect? And that's why I'm going to use a COVID because this is a perfect example, right? Where we have the impact of contamination becomes the cause of undercapacity in our ICU or, or emergency, and therefore this risk needs to be dealt with, dealt with. So coming out of that, you have the full picture. The core of this is that register. That register contains all what you need there to be able to go through this, and that's uh, it's gonna be the topic of the next video. That being said, let's take a look now. Let's use COVID, okay, as an example of how this map works and all the connection between these okay so well let's go with covid and the risk that we're looking at is contamination okay being contaminated by the virus okay that's the event there's nothing you could do with the contamination itself you need to look at the cause or you need to deal with the effect the contamination let's take a look at potential cause there and i'm not limited to that but it's just for the example you know contact in public place contact at workplace contact at house contact in you know everywhere as soon you got contact that's a problem okay that's a chance uh to be contaminated so what do we need to do to minimize these probability well you're going to recognize these things i hope so you know, social distancing, closing the public place, closing work, work from home, uh, mask, put mask, disinfect your hands. All of this, they're all tackling the probability of contact that will, you know, uh, contamination through contact. OK, and that's the title is let's lower down this so we have a lower residual on this one but we still have a residual after we've done all the social distancing and close. You know, just we're in uh, end of April right now and we have record case. 
even though a lot of the place and here in Canada, everything is closed. I mean, we are we're on very tight mode, but we still even though we're taking all these actions, we still have a residual every day. There's new cases that comes. So we have to deal with the residual. We have no choice. What's the effect of being contaminated? Well, of course, you're going to be sick, but worse, you're going to contaminate other people. You might end up in emergency room. And plus, there's other type of potential uh, problem that may occur because you're contaminated, right? You may not be able to work, etc. So, of course, we will have contingency in order to try to tackle these effects, okay? For example, you, we, uh, we're going to isolate you, okay? That's a measure that happens if we feel or you are contaminated, boom, you isolate, quarantine. That's it. It's not, it's not debatable. By doing that, we reduce, we're not reducing the sickness because there's not much we could do for sickness. Um, I think, I think Tylenol might be something, but other than that, we don't have a, a, a shot that you could take to reduce the sickness. You're going to be sick. That's it. Now, you could reduce the contamination of others by staying at home. We're going to do also the tracing to figure out who did you talk to, test them, make sure that uh, uh, they are uh, protected. Okay. Uh, which lead us to another one, which is people going to emergency room because they're too sick now. They can't stay at home. Uh, they need help. They need ventilators. They need, a, you know, a professional med uh, doctors to look at them. So now we're getting into a secondary risk, which is having our uh, health uh, care system being overrun, having hospital under capacity. And this is one of the costs that could put our hospital under capacity. And at this stage, okay, this one is the secondary risk. And that secondary risk, we have to deal with it. It's almost as more important than the first one, the primary risk, right? Or at least as important. So that's why now we have to deal with the under capacity. And you're going to hear things such as, and depending which government and which area you are in, surge and flex, which is basically being able to adapt uh, a certain area of the hospital and then bring more staff, uh, bring more beds, bring more stuff, very quick to adapt a certain, you know, peak somewhere, rerouting, balancing the network, not looking at it as individual, but looking at it as a network and say, okay, now the next one coming, go there, go there. So we're rerouting pretty much all the different case, additional closing, basically stop doing certain operation, putting aside certain case and say, we're going to delay that uh, in order to give ourselves a chance there. Okay. So that's kind of measure you see. Effect. Well, of course, in terms of contingency, we need to deal with that. So now we're putting beds, adding beds outside with tents and stuff like that, bringing the army to deal with this to the extra. Okay. The point is, now you can start to see by identifying one risk, the cause, all the action on mitigation, the contingency, the plan B for when the effects come in, the secondary, you know, that is impacted, you know, uh, by, by, by one of the impact of the contamination and the whole mitigation and contingency, all of this is documented in your register. Now you see... Uh, the image of Governor Cuomo in the top corner, right? I'm not a politician. I'm not from New York. I'm not trying to, you know, push anything. I just want to bring you something that is important. When you're going to be working this map, you need to have an ID from your own executive in the organization. Where are the area where we have tolerance and what are the area where we have zero tolerance? You know, we cannot go, Okay. And in every company, with every leaders, you know, different leaders, there are different zones of tolerance, okay, which going to drive a lot of your thinking and a lot of your decision making once you understand we can go there, we cannot go there, okay. So, for example, in this case, okay, that's why I brought Cuomo and we're going to listen to him talking about his view of where there is zero tolerance and listen to the way the you the word that is using is not going to say to his team or everybody I've got zero tolerance to that but listen to where his mind is which means if it's going to cost you more it's going to cost you more if we have to do other action to drive that down we have to drive that down okay this is not no trade-off 
Now, the same governor, well, not the same governor, but a governor in another state, especially in the U.S., uh, might have a different view in terms of tolerance versus that. They might say, well, you know, we're we going to deal with it if it happens, so don't do anything special. Just monitor it, and if it gets worse, well, we'll deal with it when it happens. Okay, and that's also uh, very present these days. You could even compare states the way they are. In Canada, it's more uh, standardized between the prime minister. They all pretty much have the same uh, zero tolerance, or tolerance look more like New York. Uh, so it, it's there's less difference. But let's take a look at how the Z Express is level of tolerance. Takes only uh, two minutes. Look between now and vaccination effectiveness. That's the window we're looking at. We're looking at December, January, February, March, April, uh, and then April, as Dr. Fauci said, you start to do the general population. Between now and then, slow the rate of spread, slow the rate of hospitalization, if you overwhelm the hospital capacity, you will have to go back to shut down. There are no options. That's not discretionary. That's not, uh, well, maybe there's an alternative. You can't overwhelm the hospital system. Overwhelming the hospital system means people die on a gurney in a hallway. And the life you could have saved, you can't save because you don't have the staff, you don't have the doctor, you don't have the nurse, and people die unnecessarily. Okay, so you could see that I'm not trying to push the Governor Cuomo. I know he's in trouble these days. So uh, my point is, by listening to your executive, okay, uh, you will figure out the zone of mm, we can't go there and go there. And it's not always the same. You might think... Uh, for example, Tesla is a risk-taking company. Uh, yes and no. They might be taking risk in certain area of their business. Uh, but when Elon Musk talk about you know manufacturing and quality and you know producing good quality, cannot take any risk. Even though they have some problem with China these days, the point is there's zero risk there. Okay, the last thing they need is some pro some problem and some recall. Okay. Again, this is not one size fits all. Well, we could take a lot. Of, we cannot take risk. There's area. You need to find these tolerance, and they're not going to be communicated with you with uh, very uh, white and black. This is good as a. There'll be a gray zone. Okay, uh, where to where you want can push. Well, you're gonna have to test the boundary when you're gonna be putting your plants. Okay, and basically. When you run it back to uh, to your stakeholders and especially some of the executive for the business risk, um, you're going to have to share with them, this is what we decided, we're going to accept that and we're going to deal with it if it turns into an issue. They might have a different uh, view on this one. Or you might say we're going to put resource to prevent this to happen, to mitigate that. They might say how much it costs. Well, total contingency cost will be 20% uh, of the budget. They might say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You have 10%. That's it. Okay. And therefore, figure out what it is absolutely the must, you know, to protect uh, with that 10% and go after that. And the rest, you deal with it if you got issues. So that's the reality in, uh, in a short run in like 23 minutes, uh, going through the full picture of risk management. Hope that was helping you. Uh, one video will be about, you know, how do you use a risk register to do everything we just, we, we just talked about.